Right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ram. I'm uh, part of Continuity and Resilience team. And uh, here we have assembled today to hear about an interesting topic. And uh, before we get on to the topic and before I move away between speaker and yourself, I just wanted to uh, share a bit of a profile of our speaker, Mr. Deepak Sethi. He is an alumnus of IIT Kanpur and I am Ahmedabad. He worked for about 27 years, quite a long corporate career which he had. And the uh, majority of that uh, 27 years was spent in Hindustan Lever and at Cadbury's. Around 2005, he started out independently on his own free, uh, consulting and training work. He is an independent director as well with Hindustan Compo Limited since uh, 2015. And he holds coaching accreditation from Ericsson Coaching International. He is a very keen student of Vedanta philosophy and uh, also an, uh, an observer of human behavior. So, as we are all here as individuals, as human beings. What is it that we really have as an objective is to be successful and to have a happy life. Thoughts actually will drive our behavior and behavior will drive our actions. And actions done when repeated become habits and which can drive your personality. So thoughts or thinking is actually, if you can look at it as a single most important competency. And if you improve that, if you improve thinking productivity, that could be a very good success factor. I'm sure we can understand and relate to this, but how many of us have been really able to execute that? Right? If you have not been able to, please don't worry about that. Uh, you're not alone. There are quite a few people, um, a lot of people, I would say, and in fact, even people among the so-called intelligent intelligentsia or so-called people who think that they know it and they have done it all, even they, those people are unable to get the execution of thinking productively right. Now, as uh, DS or Mr. Deepak Sethi would prefer to be called, he is actually living happily a life uh, based on working framework on thinking that he has put together. And he is an example of that. And uh, the key mantra behind that is active, clear thinking. And it's not only from his uh, personal point of view, he also uses that in his professional uh, career. And one of the things or a few of the things which has actually been what has been a strength are the trainings that he has provided, both corporate and open workshops uh, based on this tenet, on this principle of active clear thinking that has been used as a life skill, as a problem solving skill by many organizations. Many individuals have benefited of that. In fact, he has done business consulting as well, use this, using this particular principle and coaching and mentoring, of course, for businesses and individuals. On a personal level, his mission is actually to help people enhance their thinking productivity and thus be more successful and happier. He has been speaking on this topic extensively uh, worldwide in many places in Cape Town, in Washington in Berlin, in Chicago, and also in uh, during the COVID times, he has been having virtual conferences where he has spoken. He has also had quite a few sessions with a few government entities, with some private entities as well. Right? And uh, as this journey of happiness, which uh, DS has undertaken, he is happy to have a pit stop today here amongst us, where he has kindly agreed to share the essence of his thoughts with all of us through this session. And uh, the title of the session is very apt. It is Train Your Brain. So may I now request all of you participants to please rein in your thoughts, your wandering thoughts, I would say, for the next hour or so, so that you can focus on how DS is going to train your brain to become successful and happy. Let me also add that if you have any questions or any comments, uh, anything that you wanted to share or ask uh, DS, please put it on the chat. The chat is open. You can shoot your questions there. And we'll take it appropriately and then answer those or comment on those points. Right? Of course, it's also going to be a factor of the time. So that's also something which we'll be bearing in mind. So with all that said, uh, may I now request DS to please start and share your wonderful thoughts on active peer thinking. Over to you, Mr. DS. Thank you. Great. OK, so good afternoon, everybody. And thank you, Ram, for a lovely introduction. And also a big thank you to Continuity and Resilience 
for making available this platform and inviting me to speak on this platform. And above all, uh, we have a lot of participants going across UAE and India. So a big, big thank you for you all to have taken your time and put faith in, in actually, you know, coming for this session. You know, uh, thinking is a very important competency and I'll tell you how important it is, but it just seems to be uncharted territory. So I'm going to start off by telling you about how my journey with thinking started, but, uh, but it's, it's been a very interesting one. And uh, let me start my, my screen share so that I can take you through the thoughts that I have to share with you. Okay. So can my screen, my, my opening slide be seen, gentlemen? Yes, yeah. Okay, so the time is about quarter to four. We were a little bit late in starting. So if you are okay, and you can put it in the chat box if nobody's in a tearing hurry, we will take this one hour completely and do justice to the topic. Okay, so here we go. Uh, the announcer and the title of today's session is Tackling Corporate Brain Drain by Enhancing Thinking Productivity. So the important thing is that this session is going to deal with how corporate brain drain can actually be tackled by thinking productivity. And for that, I will even, you know, kind of talk about what corporate brain drain is. So I will cover that. But I must start by saying that when I was invited by Mr. Dheeraj Lal of uh, Continuity and Resilience, Core for short, uh, to come and speak on this platform in this topic, I was just wondering as to, you know, where does my, where do I fit in with Core's business? And then when I thought about it, it made sense because their business is continuity and resilience. And if you ask me, I cannot think of anything more important than thinking productivity to provide sustainable resilience to any organization. You get your thinking productivity sorted of your employees and for your managers, and you are home and dry. You are going to be resilient. And the rest of it, of course, will follow. So anyway, so it fits in well. And with that uh, introduction, and again, you know, a big hearty thanks to Core. Let me get into this session. So as Ram mentioned, basically we said that uh, this session is about thinking productivity. The title of the session is Train Your Brain. The two themes which run parallel are thinking productivity and the practice of thinking productivity through the mantra of active clear thinking. So you can actually imagine you know, thinking productivity and active clear thinking act for short as two sides of the same coin. Yeah, they're actually joined by the hip. So you can't talk about one without the other per se. But just for the sake of this thing, the two things are appearing on the slide. So it's about thinking productivity and active clear thinking. Now, the interesting thing is some of you will say, well, now what is this active clear thinking? The point is there is thinking and there is good quality thinking. So when it comes down to good quality thinking, the benchmark is active clear thinking and we're going to expand on this. Okay, since uh, my introduction has been given, I will not spend much of time. So as you know, I've had a decade long stints with Hindustan Levers and Cadbury's. I've also worked with Philips and Daba. And uh, 2005, I turned to business consulting under the banner of Ellie Goldratt's Theory of Constraints. And from 2017 onwards, I've also branched off in addition to business consulting, to training interventions and mentoring. More of it as we go forward. I was mentioning to you about my journey. And my journey started in 2010 when I read this book called The Choice. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, yeah, it's there on the cover. This was absolutely a game changer for me. It was a game changer for me because this was one book which basically on its very first page said, that if you want to live a happy life, if you want to live a fulfilled life, then the route forward to that is to think clearly. 
So he used the word think clearly, Eli Goldrat, the, 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 the father of TOC, uh, late Eli Goldrat. He passed away in 2011. Uh, so when I read this book, it was a game changer for me. And I said, sure, that's exactly what I want. I do want to get into living a fulfilled life. It's not there. I've been blessed to have a lot of good things, but it's nowhere close to what my aspirations are. And if this book will help me to do that, nothing like it. So I read this book five times over and I started practicing a lot and a lot of things fell into place. So let's say there is a thinking jigsaw puzzle and 60 to 70 percent fell into place by practicing the tenets, which Ellie Goldratt talks about in the book, The Choice. Yeah. Um, I must tell you the basic premise of Ellie Goldratt is, and that's the good news for everybody who's attending, and even otherwise, that when it comes down to thinking and thinking clearly, the issue is not brain power. We have adequate of it. It is blocks and obstacles. And it is those obstacles that prevent us from deploying it properly. And therefore, the choice is for all of us or let's say the interested people to overcome those obstacles. So I read the choice, 70% got sorted out, but I still wasn't feeling that I understood the thinking, you know, puzzle or the thinking problem and its solution properly. And then I hit upon Daniel Kahneman. He's a Nobel laureate and he's got the Nobel uh, the Web Prize for uh, his work. Uh, he, he's interestingly, a uh, behavioral psychologist and he got it for behavioral economics this nobel prize his book is thinking fast and slow and like ram mentioned i have been a student of vedanta so a lot of vedantic tenets fell into place and by god's grace as far as i was concerned for me and i and of course there are personal insights while being on this thinking journey which were accruing and this actually you know made me complete the puzzle uh, no puzzle is ever completed, but let's say that it got so complete that I said that I now have a thinking narrative. I have, uh, I, I have actually a story to tell about thinking. So, gentlemen and ladies, you are invited to hear the story. Yeah, about uh, about uh, thinking. Look at it as a story. Just don't go sleep. Just don't go off to sleep. Uh, but treat it as something which is, you know, a, a story which is going to unfold itself. And uh, once this was done and I started kind of talking about this at various forums, etc., cetera, uh, uh, it helped me to then develop this mission of enhancing people's pr productivity to be more successful and happy. And what I'm going to do is to establish the connection between the two, because this is what Ellie Goldratt did for me in his first page where he said that his daughter asked him, what is the choice that you made and what is it that you want? He said, I wanted to live a full life. And for that, I decided to invest in thinking. So that was my turning point. That was my journey. Yeah. So like I was saying that I've been speaking on this topic. Uh, this is uh, book my show masterclass, more of an informal, you know, kind of a session with youngsters. Uh, I spoke to a crowd in I am Ahmedabad in 2019. And uh, this is just pre COVID. If you remember 19th, 24th or something of that sort, the, the lockdown, you know, kicked in, but this is 14th of March. I spoke at Delhi Jim Khanna and my last one was just uh, post COVID. Uh, I resumed my, you know, kind of on-site sessions. And this was a corporate intervention, a full day workshop with the Swatch group of companies in Delhi. Okay. So let's start with thinking. And I, I think uh, Ram, you know, kind of uh, gave you some ideas about what thinking is and uh, the definition, etc. cetera. Uh, so uh, thinking is about generating, processing, and managing our thoughts. Ram used the word thoughts. So it's all about our thoughts. It's about generating, processing, and managing our thoughts. But what is a thought? A thought occurs in the mind. Yeah. It is a perception of an object without it being there physically. And that object uh, can be an object, physical object. It can be a being, a person. It could be an idea. 
So thought occurs in the mind and it's a perception of an object without object is as in all three uh, without it being there physically. The interesting thing is gentlemen and ladies, we are thinking 16-7. Now what does 16-7 means? It comes from 24-7 NDTV. We are thinking 16 waking hours seven days a week. And if you're sleeping only seven hours or six hours, then you are you are thinking 18-7. So our mind is a thought factory. We are churning out thoughts uh, by the, you tell me the figure. Uh, how many thoughts per day? Just put it down on the chat box. Yeah. How many thoughts does an average human being entertain? So get active on the chat and put down whatever figure comes to your mind. Obviously, there's no right or wrong answer. It's a question of a feel for it. Ram, are you getting yes. some answers? We have 1,000, some say 70,000, more than in thousands. In thousands. Somebody has an, yeah, 60,000. Somebody has an interesting number, 60,000. <laughs> great, yes. great. Excellent. Yeah, so so that's it. It, it is, it, as per literature, and as I said, uh, it's a soft figure. It's anywhere from 15 to 75 to 90,000. Uh, so I think all of you somehow seems to have got it reasonably right. I did not when I attempted it the first time. Okay, so here is the thing. Uh, I want to give you a preview uh, into what you are in for today. Okay, and I told you about, I, I look at my thinking, you know, kind of framework as a thinking narrative, as a thinking story. So that's what I'm going to tell you, what are the components of it. From your point of view, you can look at this slide to say this is the bigger picture of the session because it'll tell you what I'll, what all I'll cover. It's a huge agenda. So, so please cooperate by putting your full on attention on this. So the first thing is the LHT model. What is the LHT model? The life happiness thinking model. Ladies and gentlemen, I will connect thinking with life and happiness uh, to begin with. And this in itself is going to be hopefully change your paradigm on how you look at life and how you look at happiness and how you look at thinking. GQT, good quality thinking. Uh, I will establish that good quality thinking is the password to a happier life. It's not just an important competency. It is the key competency. I will take you through the thinking problem and establish that it's a problem of deployment. It's a productivity problem. That's why thinking productivity. What is good quality thinking? The concept of active clear thinking, assumptions. This is a term that you will and should not forget because it is the heart of good quality thinking. It is a raw material on which we work. And how that does that happen? You'll see. What are the blocks to good quality thinking? And finally, a sneak preview, can't spend too much of time, on how we all think through Daniel Kahneman's two modes. So you will get an exposure to that. And finally, the vital role of thinking productivity enhances. So, ladies and gentlemen, that is on the menu card today. It's a course meal. You will keep on getting all the courses uh, uh, in, in a structured manner. Uh, so get your plates and uh, knives and forks ready. Okay. Uh, basically, I'm going to cover these by answering the four questions which I, we had put down in the announcer. Why think about thinking? And that's where the LHT model comes in. What is the role criticality? What is good quality thinking? What are the blocks? How do we think? And finally, some thinking productivity enhances. Right. So, ladies and gentlemen, fasten your seat belts for today's session. Are you guys ready? Are you all ready for today's session, given this introduction? Let's have some show of thoughts, comments, and uh, and uh, energy on the chat box. Yeah, we have a few SS coming. Because, because if you are, uh, then fasten your seatbelt because this is going to be a mega, mega session for you. Yes, uh, Ram, you were saying something? Uh, yeah, I, I was just saying that, yes, there are quite a few people who answered in the affirmative. Yes, ready, more than ready. More than ready. Okay, so if you're more than ready, then here we go. 
Okay, you can see that there's a lot of information in those eight themes, and I'm taking the tall order of not compromising on any of the chapters. Uh, but please, uh, and, and therefore, there's a lot of new information, there will be new perspectives. So keep an open mind on that per se. Okay. And uh, uh, there will be a lot of abbreviations, just bear with them. Okay. Uh, follow up. Now, this is the point, because the content is heavy, and I'm going to run through it, and I'm doing it in a summary form, uh, uh, we thought about it and I said, how can we actually deliver full value to people who have chosen to attend this session? And the commitment to deliver full value is total. So in that context, we've decided on, on, decided on two things with CORE. I have offered to have a follow-up session on the 9th of November at 3.30. So, gentlemen and ladies, three weeks from now, if there is sufficient interest, subject to that, huh, I'll make myself available for this session. And uh, you can then put your questions and most importantly, share your thoughts and perspectives and your experiences after a period of three weeks in this uh, second round of invitation, which is on the 9th of November. I will also make available uh, a, a summary deck of some eight, 10 slides okay, which are actionable, so that you will have them at the back, uh, you know, with you as a reference point per se. So this is to ensure that uh, some, some of the points that you don't get down to noting, you will still be able to pick them up, hopefully in the slides. But my earnest request to you is, uh, okay, let me ask you a quick question. How many people are sitting with a paper and a pencil and are actually, you know, taking down notes have already taken an intent taking down notes. I just want to get a good quick count. So just put yes, yes, yes. And Ram, you can just tell me. Anyway, so, so, three, you, can, yes. so peop, you are people who are not, I suggest if a pen and a pencil and, and a note paper is available, handy, huh? please get it. Even if you have to get up from your seat for a minute, please do that because there's a lot of material and best that you note down the way you note down things per se. Okay, so with that, we are ready to roll. Aspect one, what is thinking's role in my life? And that's where the life happiness thinking model kicks in. Yeah. Okay, gentlemen, uh, people, that's much better. Uh, we are born. One day, Inevitably, someday we will all pass on, pass away, we will all die. Yeah. In between is what is life, right? So the issue is what exactly is the is you know what constitutes life and what is its unit, right? And when you think about that, the unit of life, because this is time, birth and death. Yeah. So the unit of life has to be something to do with time. So the unit of life is an experience. What is an experience? An experience is an event or occurrence with some impact. It has a start time and it has an end time. So please note two characteristics. Occurrence with some impact and start and end time. And that is the unit of life per se. What that means is that you can say that life is a flow of experiences because each experience gives place to the next one. So it's experience here, experience here, experience here. And the sum total is called the life because the unit of life is an experience. Now, an experience can be routine, minor, important, or it could be big ticket, right? Uh, most of us look at an experience as a flow, okay, as, as, a, as a river flowing. But uh, uh, and then you, when you look at the flow, it actually almost is like a production line where each of the experiences is flowing by us per se. So a better way to look at life is not as a flow of a river, which is how we have generally looked at life, but to look at it as a discrete flow of experiences, more like a production line. In short, we are born and our life, we've seen many, many experiences, and this is the moment we are here. 
Okay. And from this moment onwards, we will see many more experiences. Yeah. And that is what life is all about till we die. Right. So that is really the construct and flow of life. So we, we have dealt with life. Okay. So the point being that viewing life as a flow of discrete experiences is a very empowering way of looking at life because it gives us control over it. Otherwise, life is flowing by and we are just, you know, kind of things are happening to us. But the moment you look at it as a discrete experience, it gives us control over it. How does it give control? We will come to that in a minute. But before that, uh, what are we looking in life? Ram said success and happiness of some sort or the other. So we are all see what 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 we are seeking in life is happiness and that happiness can be pleasure, success, peace, fulfillment. Everybody wants, you know, all of this at different measures, at different points of time, etc., etc. So let's just kind of club all these four as the good old smiley to represent that that is what we are looking for. And anything and everything we think or do is to be happy. That's, that's premise one. That's the most important premise. Now let's look at another dimension of happiness, the dynamics of happiness. Yeah. Think of a joy meter. Let's say that in an experience, if the outcome is to your choice, it is bound to make you happy, in which case the needle will swing huh, to agree. If the experience goes badly, the ex it, it will be somewhere on the left-hand scale. So in other words, Transactional happiness is happening at the end of each experience where assume that, you know, the needle is swinging and if you have 100 experiences in a day, the needle would have swung 100 times, right? And it can swing any, it can go to anywhere from green down to orange, red or whatever. So in a day, it will go through many such things, right? Obviously, we want it to be going into green. Think of another instrument called the happiness meter that every time this needle swings, it actually goes and deposits itself into a happiness meter. Okay. And therefore, the definition of happiness is what do, meaning, as you can see, anybody's happy, happy meter is that from, you know, whatever time period you're considering, you've been collecting the outcome of experiences. So all of us, We've got greens, yellows, and oranges. What we actually want is to fill it up with maximum number of greens. So when you ask somebody, how's life been? And when he actually says, you know, life is going great or life is going good, he's actually saying a lot of my experiences in this happiness meter are green. Okay. And if this, if another person or at another point of time in the last one week, you could say, well, life is, hasn't gone well. It means a lot of your experiences have been on the left-hand side. Folks, people, this is a very important concept. By the way, you know, these are not absolute definitions. So this is a caveat. These are working definitions that I am proposing because that's how I have constructed them. They make an integrated narrative and they work beautifully well. And this is the way one could look at happiness, which is that it is happiness, you know, swinging swinging joy meter and the joy meter finally reflecting in the happiness meter uh, and what we want is to collect as many greens am i am i clear so far let's have some quick inputs I really request you to be super fast on the chat box because then ram can tell me if 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 the this large crowd is with the flow yes. we have to okay. yes okay Fine. So this is transactional and this is the stock. At any point of time, what is my stock of green? What is my stock of orange? And so on and so forth. Right? Okay. That brings us to the interesting point that life is a flow of experiences and experience is best analyzed through the CEO box. Now, what is a CEO box? Yeah. A CEO box is choice, experience, outcome. What does that mean? Huh? It goes something like this. Here is an experience. This experience, you make a choice. When you make a choice, okay, uh, you will get an outcome, right? Uh, and the outcome 
Huh? Everybody wants a happy outcome. And people, this is the critical one. How do you make the choice? Because it is the choice that's important. And for that, sometimes in a same experience, there could be multiple choices that you have to make. You start by making a choice, then you make the choice in between of how to keep that experience going. Yeah. And our choice drives the outcomes. That's point one to be remembered. That the outcome will depend upon the quality of choice. And it is thinking that drives the choice. And through that outcomes, finally, our happiness level. So, gentlemen, this is where thinking kicks into life and happiness. We are all looking for happy outcomes driven by choices. And what drives our choices is thinking. You don't get any OTB from the Lord to say you. You know, you plug this in. You make the choice with your own thinking. And if I really had the luxury, I would have asked you to pause for two minutes. Look at the gravity of that statement. So therefore, your life is under your control through experiences. And your experience is under your control through your thinking. And therefore, what you have to ensure is that you are actually churning out good quality thinking. That's what thinking productivity is about. And that makes thinking not an important competency, but the single most important competency and enhancing thinking productivity to be a burning priority. It's not been so. So let me take this opportunity to compliment all the wise people who decided to opt for attending this program, uh, because at least you would have now seen how thinking integrates with life and happiness, and it is a single most important competency. And you should then be saying, oh, so how well do I think and how do I improve my thinking productivity? That should be the automatic question. Yeah. So good quality thinking helps you to make the right choice in the experience. You'll take the right action. Right desired outcome will happen, right? And then happy experience will happen. Please note, it is a unit. Yeah, it is an experience which is happy, right? And then a lot of happy experiences means a happy life. So a life is not happy, you know, on the aggregate. It is an aggregate of experiences. Yeah, and you control that with good quality thinking yeah? and happy life. And people, that means that thinking is the key to a happier life. Yeah? And life is a flow of experiences. Life can be viewed as a flow of discrete experiences. We started with this, discrete experiences. And by, ex by exercising the right choice in the experience, thinking drives our happiness level and is the password to our happiness. But before I go on to that slide, huh? There is a, the next question, if it is a thing, single most important competency, one would expect that by and large people would have you know, been thinking well. But our problem is that thinking, our thinking is below par and below potential. So here is good quality thinking, the need of the R, and our thinking is, gentlemen, something like this. I'll give you two minutes to soak in. I hope you can see the irony and 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 the suboptimality in this picture. See, he, this guy is tying his left shoelace, right? And the left shoelace actually is on the ground, whereas a normal thing would have been, it should have been lying on the chair because then it was, he had to bend less and he would have tied it. But this is how he is doing. What this means is that his laces will not be as tight because it is, he's got to bend that much low and by Jove, by the age of 35, 40, he's bound to have a severe lower back problem. Okay. Now, the irony of it is uh, many times life is like this picture. You have the resources of thinking, but you make poor decisions. That's how we are making a poor decision. And you can see that is why our output, our happiness level is below our potential. And there is so much of stress uh, that comes in, like the back problem here. Yeah. Life is happy in patches, mediocre mostly, and stressful in chunks. Yeah. Uh, okay. So the good news is that the brain power is adequate, like I mentioned to you. Uh, 
Look at it like this. It's a transmission picture. Huh? The thing is, this is the brain power. This is the wheel and there is a transmission in between. Now we want action here. We want good smooth movement here, which means we want happy experiences in these situations. The problem is not in brain power. Therefore, the problem is in the transmission of the engine brain power. What this means is that it's not a brain power issue, but it's an issue of how we deploy. Yeah. So good. And the other point to note is that good quality thinking and reasoning is an evolved skill. Most of us actually believe thinking to be an activity. And I think uh, Swami Parthasarthi captured it very well. He said people do not seem to realize that thinking is skilled work. On the contrary, they believe it is a natural process like breathing or eating. If it is not so, if you are to develop the faculty of thinking, reasoning, you need to devote as much time and effort to it as you would, uh, as you would to learning any other skill. And this is a quote by Swami Parthasarthi. Uh, his book was shown earlier, The Fall of Human Intellect. Uh, and this is these are evolved skills. And they're playing golf, playing piano, good quality carpentry are evolved skills. Okay. And just as you have to learn, practice, understand the theory, everything in a major way, uh, you would you will need to do that for thinking as well. But that's not what happens. Nine out of 10 people fail to recognize this and do not develop it as a skill. The question you will ask is, but what about all the lovely education that we've had? Okay, what about the school and the best of institutes that we've been to? Yeah, I'm saying that is necessary, but not sufficient because that treats thinking as more of a problem solving skill. It gives you a lot of domain knowledge, but there is no great training on how to think well. Tell me, people who have attended college and program and, and, and MBA programs, etc. Was there a thinking 101 program? There is a marketing 101. There is a production 101. There is an ops management, finance 101. There is no thinking 101. The need of the art is thinking 101. And you people are here lucky to be enrolled into this thinking 101 program today. Okay. I'm going to put down these situations, right? These are life situations. And I want you to just see what comes to your mind. Huh? It's either a yes or a no. Do you feel familiar? Do you feel that you are in that position? Huh? So just keep a, you know, say yes or no and keep account of it. Aspiration reality gap, falling short in getting the outcomes you had wanted and still want in your life. Activity trap, what does that mean? High on activity levels, achievement level in sub goals don't seem to match efforts. Achievement in levels huh, in life uh, don't seem to match efforts. Below par relationships. And the problem is that the worst of relationships is with people where it matters the most, our loved ones. Weak in influencing. You're excited and confident about your point of view and solution. Yet, when we present it, it cuts no ice with the other person, right? We can influence it. Procrastination, truly stuck. You're not in action, you should be in action. Irritable, getting upset on others, unfair comments, etc. Complaining often. Conversations and thinking is largely centered around upsets and complaints and not so much on problem solving. Do you see yourself in? In this is the seventh situation, eighth situation, and overall sense of well being and being in control. So, gentlemen, eight situations, people, eight situations, please decide huh, as to how much can you relate to it. Does it sound familiar? Huh? So, the issue really is is this present or elusive? And therefore, the question is how many yeses for you? So, Will you just put down on the chat box that when it comes down to thinking about your own life with how many of these situations and problems can you associate with by saying a yes. Yes will mean that it is either not working for you or it is not working at a level by which you would want it to work. So can we have some answers in the chat box? So we have somebody with uh, three yes. Mm -hmm. 
And so far, that's the only response that we have got. What's some more responses, gentlemen? Somebody has five years. Five years. Okay, so here's the thing. Average is four. But imagine if for the average of the attendees here and for people, four issues are not, you know, kind of working the way they should be. Huh? These are all symptoms which indicate below power thinking. What that means is that once you understand the technology of thinking and you are able to enhance your thinking productivity, a lot of these programs will come down to a very manageable level or, or they will actually even disappear. And this is going to be in one of the slides that I'm going to send you. So you can do your own uh, evaluation in a fair manner. Uh, and uh, my email ID will be shared with you. By all means, you can get in touch with me with if you have any thoughts on this part per se. Okay, so here is the thing. What this is showing is that this is our thinking current capacity. This is the current capacity and potential. You can see that the bar is here, right? And actually speaking, this is the actual performance of our thinking. We are, we are at this level. We are, what does this mean? that we are jumping below our potential. We are thinking below our potential, okay? Which is why the manifestation was in the earlier chart, yeah? At a personal level per se. And what does this mean in a corporate life? When a company takes its employees, it assumes that it is paying for his or her brain power and therefore all that brain power is available. But the brain power is without even the employee knowing actually he's performing at his below potential. So what does that mean? That you've got, you are filling it by hiring managers, you've been hired, uh, full bucket, but what you have is a brain drain happening without managerial exit. So even though there is no exit, there is brain drain that is happening, brain power is getting lost because of the phenomena here. And if that is the case, then this is a much bigger brain drain, gentlemen and ladies, than the people who leave. And even if that's a high number and you correct for this, huh? in any case, these two can be corrected independently. But I can tell you, if you correct for this, then your, your, your physical exit will also be uh, reducing. So you have to plug the leaks. Huh? This is a blind spot for both the organizations and the individuals. And the plug and the uh, leakage needs plugging at both the levels, at the individual level, at the individual level, and also in the way the organization thinks. And that's what I mean by saying both levels, individual and organizational level. In any case, when the individual thinking productivity goes up, the organizational productivity goes up as it is. But beyond that, there is an organizational thinking process, and that productivity also needs to be increasing. And uh, no wonder surprising, it's not surprising, or well, it, it was surprising to me when I saw the data that in a World Economic Forum report uh, in 2025, they identified 10 skills, and of this, five skills were, five out of the 10 were connected to thinking. Just to prove the point that we are thinking below R and below potential, and the need of the R is to fix that. So let's therefore, uh, get on to the solution mode now. Now, the first part of the solution is that if we have to improve something, we must know what exactly is the benchmark. What is the difference between thinking and good quality thinking, right? Okay. What constitutes good quality thinking? Now, the universe is working people. It's working fine. Everything is in control, right? I mean, the constellations, everything. Uh, and that's because there is the principle of causality. There is the law of causality that is working, which says that all reality is governed by cause and effect, right? What does this mean? This means we are trying to now figure out what constitutes good quality thinking. Don't forget the purpose of, of this deep dive. It says every cause, this is what this principle says, every cause has an effect 
uh, and every effect has a cause. So there is no effect which can take place without a cause. And if there is a cause, there has to be an effect. Now we've all heard about it. We may have, but as Ram was saying, how many have really, really thought about it? And how much do we bring it, bring into our execution? We are, cons and, and, and this is it. We are, how do we use this? And when you have to use this to answer what is good quality thinking, here is the answer. We are constantly working to create effects to our liking. Yes or no? Yes. Okay, I can't see you and I can't see your response, uh, but we have established that we are always wanting to create happy outcomes because in our, in our experiences. Uh, for that, you need to know the factor that causes the effect that you want as per the principle of causality. Yeah, so if you know the factor that will give you the right result, you are home and dry. And how do you get to know that factor? Uh, that is where the Lord has endowed us with the thinking quality and therefore good quality thinking, its purpose is to help figure out the correct cause effect linkages that govern the situation of interest to us, right? So good quality thinking is basically to understand the cause effect linkage in the situation of interest to us. You don't have to understand everything, but you need to understand the cause effect linkage. For example, I'm wearing my specs, yeah. So if, if there were no specs, I needed to understand the cause effect, meaning the first person who invented, he understood the cause effect linkage of how the light rays come, go through the, you know, the, the pupil, and then finally collect on the retina, but they are not collecting well on the retina because the lens is faulty and therefore you need corrective lens. Okay, so if I want the effect, I should know the cause that the, I, that the rays are not collecting on the retina properly. So everything with that example, uh, you can keep that in mind. Now the active process of using our thoughts to figure out the correct causality and making our choices and decisions based on that is termed as active clear thinking. That is what this million dollar term is about. Huh? It is about identifying the correct causality in the situation and working with it per se. Okay. Seems very complicated because I'm using this fancy word called causality and cause effect linkages, but I can assure you, and I don't have to assure you, Ellie Goldrat assures by saying that actually what you require for that is common sense. Okay. Common sense is available with everybody. Brain power is not the issue. So here it is. Thinking clear. Thinking is just an activity. Management of thoughts, you know, generation of thoughts. Thinking clearly is correct cause effect linkages. And good quality thinking is when you know correct cause effect linkages and this is a benchmark of good quality thinking and the process of getting there because that requires you to you know exercise your brain yeah it, it is not difficult but it requires effort huh? that is active clear thinking so active clear thinking is the mantra yeah now this word causality was a little bit uh, kind of uh, scary huh? so just look at it like this huh? I'm giving you now a little bit of a thinking productivity enhancer. Here is a laundry machine, not working. Can I fix it? Can you fix it? No. You call the mechanic to fix it. Why? Because the mechanic knows how the machine works. When I say, you say, I'm calling the mechanic because he understands, he knows how the machine works. What we are saying is he understands the cause effect linkages inside the machine. He understands that there is a transformer. He understands there is a rotor and how they are connected and how it finally kind of rotates in the drum and how it dries, etc. You and I don't, he understands. Okay. And at the end of the day, therefore, in order to fix the machine, we need to know how does it work. That means we must understand the causality of this machine. Yeah. Gentlemen, ladies, the good news is that all human situations are like a laundry machine. Okay. If you can figure out 
how they are working, the cause effect, just as you can figure it out here, you can actually fix it. Okay. So this is just to say that the trigger for trying to get to that correct causality, because we want, you know, to get the right effect by getting the right cause, uh, is just to ask the question, how does it work? Because just as a, for the laundry machine, you had to ask the question, how does it work? You ask that question and it will trigger off the fact that do I understand the causality? Okay. If okay. I may, uh, if I may interrupt yeah. you, Ms. Uh, Mr. Sethi, uh, we just have about a max of 15 minutes. So that's, I just wanted to update you on that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Can I, can I get request the, the people just to show, show of hands, uh, just to say, can we extend it by another five, seven minutes or so? Yeah, we have two, two participants who raise their hand. Meaning, sh should I take, actually, people should raise their hands if the majority is... Yeah, five, yeah. six, yeah, six of them have raised their hands. Okay, so great. I, I believe, yeah. yes, that's In any case, yeah, we, we have to go till 4.45, but I'm taking five minutes more. I will cover it, not to worry. So the question is how, and thanks, Ram, for reminding. How do I know that I'm thinking clearly? This is like asking the question, how do I know causality I'm using is correct? And for that, the answer is I've got to work with assumptions. So we must understand assumptions. Yeah? Because that's what I said is the heart of good quality thinking. Yeah, the nature of assumptions is, and this is an important point to understand, it is the reason as seen by you for existence of that cause effect relationship, for that logical relationship. Yeah? You can see that in our life, very often we consciously sit to establish the logic and the assumption is the reason as seen by you, and that's important for the existence of why you think a certain cause will cause a certain uh, effect per se. It is the answer to because sometimes it is stated and sometimes it is unstated. We believe them to be true, the assumptions. Huh? In reality, they may or may not be so. So we believe that, 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 uh, that it is so, but it may not be. For example, you know, I ask the question huh, to say, can we extend by 10 minutes? You time, time to 4.45. 10 minutes, I said, can be extended. And so I was making an assumption here that this was the reason why I asked because I thought that people actually may be able to spare the 10 minutes because they may not be terribly tied up on the other hand. So that was my reason for doing this thing. I'm just showing you an application of this. Yeah. Now that may be true, in which case it will be a good decision to go with 5-10 minutes extra. If it is not true, yeah, and that's the point to note that an assumption may or may not be true. Uh, and, and therefore, from that point of view, uh, you need to check whether an assumption is true or not true. Uh, but an assumption is the reason what you believe is true. Let's take a statement. Sales are under pressure. Let's lower our prices. A lot of us, especially in sales, but even in senior management meetings, uh, this often happens. Sales are under pressure. And the first, you know, kind of impulse reaction is to do this. Now, what we are saying is that this assumption can either be a fact, the reason why we believe, it could be a belief or a conviction, it could be data, it could be information, uh, it could be a concept. That means that the reason why we believe something can be any one of this. Uh, but the important thing is to see, is that true? Is that valid? It could even be a principle, right? Okay. So, what is the assumption we are making here? Sales are under pressure. Let's lower our prices. Here the cause is lower our prices. The effect will be our sales will increase. So if, I, if we want sales to increase, we must lower our prices. Why? Because we believe our prices are uncompetitive. Now, this is an unstated assumption. Okay. I told you this can be stated or unstated. So when people say that, the inherent statement or inherent assumption, which in this case is the belief conviction, is that our prices are uncompetitive. Because if that was not the case, then it will not make sense per se. Right? So, the idea is that if we lower our prices, more customers will buy our product, which means our prices are uncompetitive. That's what it means. Now, the important thing is, if valid, then the identified cause-effect linkage is correct. And then we are thinking clearly because then the assumption is true. We made an assumption, 
the assumption is true that means cause effect is valid and therefore we can go in the question is is the assumption valid in this particular case as it happened when the company did its analysis they found that the business is getting lost to a competitor who is actually 10 percent higher than them right and that makes the original assumption wrong so this is an example that thinking was not clear Huh? And therefore, this was a wrong decision. Sales are under pressure. Let's lower prices would be a bad decision because the assumption under that is not valid. This tells you, gentlemen and ladies, that in order to think clearly, you need to question your assumptions. And if you are able to get to valid assumptions, then you know you are thinking clearly. So this is the answer to the question, how do I know I'm thinking clearly? If I get present to the assumptions, basis which I'm taking that decision, and if that is valid, then I am thinking clearly, right? An easy, simple process to do this is called the AYHY coin. A simple process, quick fire process for checking out an assumption. And why is it AYHY coin? AY stands for ask yourself, why do I believe X causes Y, X is uh, causing Y, surface assumptions, and hear yourself if the assumptions are valid or carry out a validity check and if they are valid then you are thinking clearly and you can go ahead with the decision why do i use the word hear yourself because the interesting thing is that logic is audio in nature by audio i mean that by and large when you say something which is not logical you will be able to pick it up so in 50 to 60 percent of the cases if you just go through this exercise of ayhy ask yourself hear yourself you will know that you are not thinking correctly so anytime you are about to do something take a major initiative just ask yourself hear yourself i am doing this because of my assumption is that assumption sounding correct to you hearing will help you that yeah, you can even say it loud, huh? you are home and dry. So this is something which will take care of 60%. Otherwise, you may want to carry out a proper check as this company did. They looked at all the data, etc. But that's because to begin with, it sounded incorrect to some people that no, no, I don't think so. Our prices are in incomparative. And then they checked it out that they were losing to a competitor who was 10% higher. There are three stages of thinking. Initial is impulsive random related thoughts about an issue it leads to some kind of half-baked thinking finally going to correct causality valid thinking now our decisions should be based on clear thinking valid assumptions the problem is that we tend to be bare minimum thinkers so we get blocked somewhere here yeah we are in one of these two so the three stages actually become three levels per se and we generally operate from level one and two okay so let me now quickly demystify and, and explain some of the blocks to good quality thinking because your question will be listen what is this you know why am i not able to think clearly etc we just talked about how to check whether you're thinking clearly we've done so far that the benchmark of good quality thinking is correct think correct causality Correct causality is valid assumptions. That's how you check it out. The question is, why am I not, why am I getting stuck in level one and two? Why am I not going to the final level of clear thinking? And the reason is that, you know, and I have enough brain power. I've got, gone to the best uh, institutes, etc. I'm well educated. I'm with a good company. The question is, why do smart things, people do dumb things? And that's because of these four blocks and impeding factors one is we tend to be mentally lazy ladies and gentlemen in this program just the awareness of these concepts about the need for thinking productivity the basics of thinking productivity the blocks to thinking productivity in itself will get you the low-hanging fruits that's the objective of the program mental laziness play of emotions emotions actually play havoc with our thinking and we'll see some examples our notion that reality is complex we we are capable of thinking through but somewhere we are overawed by the problem and we say oh my god i can't do it and we just give it up prematurely 
and anti-intellectual bias. You know, a lot of a lot of us actually believe uh, that it's you know it's it's a play of of head and heart. People say, no, 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 I'm a heart person, but I'm a feelings person. So they actually have a little bit of a bias against the intellectual thinking of people, etc. Uh, so let's let's take the first two, and this is beautifully captured in the next stage of how we think. Okay, and this is a thinking dynamics, and this is Daniel Kahneman section. This is again new information. So, like I said, fasten your seatbelt and get ready for collecting the concepts here. Thinking, we think in two modes, fast and slow, hmm? comes from his book. Hmm? So let me tell you what are these fast and slow modes. I show you a picture and I'm sure all of you sitting in this room would have said this girl is angry, she's upset, she's looking very, very unhappy for some reason. If I say bread and butter, two plus two, four, you are driving on an empty road, you can drive and cruise very easily. These are all examples. Uh, you can see here the thinking was fast and negligible effort. It was intuitive. It was knee jerk. Uh, it was emotional. It was unstructured. It, you just got the answer. You didn't, you, don't, you didn't have to make any effort for it. This is system one, gentlemen. System one, the fast system. Okay. I put this equation to you, 24 into 17. And now everybody's got the brain working here the brain was working almost automatically here the brain has to work consciously similarly if i was to say count the occurrence of letter a in this page tell somebody your close relatives phone number these days we wouldn't even remember that but you'll have to struggle to do that compare two products washing machine whatever whatever uh, basically this kind of thinking is slow and effortful logical, rational, deliberate, structured, yeah? and therefore this is called the system two. So Daniel Kahneman talks about fast and slow modes, and then he calls them system one and system two. For shortness, I call them system S1 and S2, okay? Please remember, S1 is like the rabbit, the hare, and S2 is like the tortoise, because it's slow, it's effortful. The important thing is for us to realize that all our thinking is in either of the two modes. All choices, decisions are driven by either S1 or S2 or a combination of these. So we need to understand these S1, S2 modes. Here are some examples uh, of how S1 mode works. You walk into a, into a restaurant and you just you know, decide in, in no time uh, as to where you will be sitting, etc. Whether you should be changing your sketch pen colors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? These are S2 decisions where S2 is the key driver. Which college to attend? To send your child for higher education now or not? Do you need to change careers, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Okay. Okay. Now we all understand S2 because that's what we associate thinking with. For us, thinking is applying our mind, etc. But the idea to realize is, and that's the contribution of Daniel Kahneman, that the bulk of our thinking is actually taking place in the fast mode, in the S1 mode, without our realizing. And that is the contribution of this, uh, this section of the total narrative. So S1 thinking, some of the common triggers and origins are past memories and associations, pattern making, intuition intuitively two plus two we say four uh, uh, if there is a car coming in and we're crossing the road we'll either jump up or we we'll kind of go uh, forward a piece instinctively uh, then we have emotions and uh, which are likes and dislikes and ego there is the herd instinct everybody is doing it uh, that also triggers the s1 thinking convenience it's easy you know you don't want to make any effort and the action that you take is convenient, so you give that, and there are some biases. So as you can see, this list is on the left, uh, is in the blue, this is in red. This is in red because these one has to be particularly care of, careful of, because all, all triggers and all S1, huh, we need to be careful about. Hmm, 
all the more reason because driving our life very, very prominently, more so the ones on the right side per se. Why do I say that? You have to be careful. This is how S1 works. I'm spending time on S1 because we all understand S2, which is conscious deliberating. We may not be very good at it, which is one big section that I cover on how to use thinking properly to get the causality. But I'm talking about a blind spot, which is S1 thinking. We don't know about this. If I was to give this to you, most people will be able to make sense of this. Okay, this is S1 in action. This message, you know, serves to prove how our minds can do amazing things. Uh, now, there was no T here, there was a seven, there was no T here, there was a seven, uh, and M E S S. But you can see past memories and associations at work. That's the beauty of S1. Okay. ABC is what we will read. But it could have been A, 13, C. But the chances are we are right when we see A, B, C. Okay. Okay. Which of the girls is bigger? Most people, right, will say this is the bigger pair. But actually, it's again illusory. It's an optical illusion. It's a response of an S1. Okay. And no. Actually, they are all equal in size. So this one is like this. It is only because of the perspective in which this picture has been drawn. There is a very standard thing to say. Anyway, I, I, let me move forward. The idea basically is to say that S1 is fast. It's an easy thing to do, but it is prone to errors. Okay. And there are um, teens of examples where we go wrong with it per se. So just to tell you the, the structure of S1 and S2. S1 is impulsive and S2 is cognitive. Fast, negligible, and it is used for routine decisions and repetitive situations or in emergency situations. So it's used in any one of this. Choosing which table to take at a, this thing is a, is a very routine, inconsequential kind of a decision. So S2 does not come into play and we use S1. Huh? It supports S2 decision making by throwing up ideas, etc. And then S2 works further on them. The problem is it's efficient and fast, but reliability has limitations uh, because it does not actually spend any time. Uh, it is based on past memories and everything. They may be right, they may be wrong. And therefore, the chances of being wrong are higher. S2 is slow and effortful. This is used for deciding in normal situations uh, and com complex situations, any kind of problem solving, analyzing, whether it is normal or complex. It is the boss. Please note, and this is the important thing. And it is the boss because it has a higher probability of being right. Right? So therefore, you, S2 has in a way hired S1 to say, boss, mera thoda load tum share kar lo. Okay, I don't need to spend my time because I don't want to cramp up my capacity. So you take some routine decisions and help me to make my decisions. So S2 is the boss. He is the subordinate. Huh? But ultimately, these are two living characters with their own special ways, styles and nuances. You've seen them operate in the person's head so, for thinking. So in a way, that picture that you saw of the hare and tortoise in the head, the hare and the tortoise are sitting in our brain system and working with us okay so this was a situation where s1 was the s2 was the boss s1 was the subordinate and the problem really is uh, this is the way the situation is happening uh, that s1 because it is easy uh, it has started actually dominating uh, and therefore it is actually sitting karam say uh, on the tortoise and therefore the problem really is that a lot of our decisions are now error prone because of our S1 thinking. Okay, because S1 thinking, because of its nature, is prone to, because it is fast, because it does not work with the specifics, it just kind of makes broad connections, etc. It is more likely to be wrong than S2. But by and large, S1 is right. Okay, like we said, two plus two, four, you can't be wrong with it. Yeah, we said bread and butter, your answer, nobody's going to say, no, I, I had jam in mind. 80%, 90% people say, no, it's bread and butter was what I was looking for. So it works, 
but it is prone to errors and it started dominating and that's why our choices have become error prone and therefore our life is not going as smoothly because we are taking a lot of wrong, wrong choices and that's because of our over dependence on S1. The moment you understand this and you can see the nuances of S1 and S2, ladies and gentlemen, you will start automatically correcting. This is an assumption I'm making that awareness will lead to 40% to 50% correction. So you can actually visualize a major change just by keeping in mind the concept of S1 and S2, right? So here we are living our life, juggling between S1 and S2, as I have explained to you. It's not a straight juggle of one ball versus worse because we are doing a lot of S1 and then S2 comes in. So it's even more complicated than this figure, right? And, and, and we need to, we need to use uh, S1 for its uh, efficiency and we need to use S2 for its reliability. That is the challenge of thinking, okay? The challenge is how do we manage the two modes in real time, S1 and S2, right? And this is both the challenge and the opportunity that if you can optimize between S1 and S2, you will be home and dry, yeah? How do you do that? The recommended option is the pause and review button, right? Uh, so just remember, pause and review. What does this mean? Hmm? This means develop this as a habit. What is this habit? This habit is that to minimize S1 errors. Why are we discussing this? We are saying we are using S1 and S2. We are planned, nature has planned us to use S1. Somewhere down the line, we have started over depending on S1. S1 is more error prone. Therefore, S1 leads to more errors. Huh? And therefore, I must optimize and bring S2 when S1 is the wrong choice of using the S1 mode. And in the gap time, what do I mean by gap time? There is a stimulus, there is a response. Stephen Covey, if you remember, in between is a gap time. Hmm? Most of us are mentally lazy during this gap, gap time. Okay. In this gap time, look inwards, become aware that am I taking this decision because of S1 or S2? S1 means it was knee jerk without thinking, it came, it just came instinctively and automatically. Or am I doing it with S2? And if you think it was S1 and this situation is more important, then switch to S2 if required. Okay. There is, there is other criteria which I cover in my program of what is the criteria for switching to S2, but this is good enough. The moment you know it is S1, and you, especially if it is a bad S1, if that S1 is coming from your emotions and from your herd instinct because you have not applied your mind, it's an important issue, then please think about it, right? Okay, the last section uh, of productive. Mr. Yeah. Lee, about five more minutes because after yeah. that, the system itself will close. Oh, okay. The system itself will collapse. Can we? Uh, can we? It will close. Uh, we have. That's what I mean. That's what I mean. So, uh, well, in that case, I'm st I'm going to stop in five minutes' time. Okay, perhaps even less, and we will then try and see uh, if you can all reconvene for just five more minutes to at least we can talk about you know as to where do you go, how do you use all this knowledge. Okay, so basically, this is saying decluttered. Simple concept is that please, please, please. Uh, keep your thinking back, bandwidth free for S2. You got the whole picture now. Uh, so keep knocking out stuff, uh, which is not to be attended now, because if it is there, it will clog your system. Put it on a paper, device, pocket, notebook, etc., etc., and have a retrieval system. Okay. Pencil to paper. That's what I was making, because pencil to paper helps a lot. The first thing it does, it helps us to declutter, because the moment you've noted it down, pencil to paper, it's off your head and you can apply and use it for S2, but there are many other advantages huh, of uh, putting to paper. Your own thinking becomes clear, just as audio helps to see the logic. When you put it down on a piece of paper, an illogical thing will show up and that is what we have to guard against. Yeah, so take down notes in meeting, developmental sessions, etc. use highlighters. Uh, this is a very important thing. As you can see, you know, I, I, I use these highlighters uh, because I find that even my notes become very copious, so I highlight what's important. In fact, I use a coding system of uh, green being very important, 
blue being call for action, et cetera, et cetera. This is based on De Bono's system of uh, you know, the color coding, et cetera, blue being for action. Okay, so two enhancers we've talked about. I've already talked about this habit of uh, how does it work. Any situation, just say laundry machine, and that metaphor will trigger off that uh, will to say that have I got the causality right? And for checking out the causality, once if you have, don't have the causality, apply your mind and get the causality. Having got it, see the AY HY coin and see what happens there. Yeah, in terms of uh, hear yourself and check yourself. Okay, uh, since this is anyway covered, I will not cover, but I will go straight on to. Uh, uh, yeah, I just want to say, leave you with this parting thought. This is the Gayatri Mantra on the left side. The Gayatri Mantra, Om Bhur Bhuva Soha Tasavitur Varedyam Bhargo Deva Siddhi Mahi Dhyo Yo Naha Prachodayat. The operative word is Dhyo Yo Naha Prachodayat. It ends by saying, may the Lord, may he set our intellects in the right direction. May he end enhance our thinking productivity okay may we use our brain power and, and our intellect because this mantra realizes that it is our thinking that shapes our life and we are gathered here to chisel hone and give a jump a, a major exponential jump to our thinking productivity where from here and this is what i wanted to say uh, i talked about this interactive session 9th of November, 3.30 p.m. It'll be more of a round table. Yeah. Uh, question and answers, general contributions, any question that you have. I'm, I know that we've not had the chance. Implementation issues, takeaway, uh, you know, uh, 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 this thing, anything that you have about the takeaways. Uh, and I think Ram will put up a Google link and uh, somebody from the backup team may also put my email ID, etc. We have your email ID, so we will, we will be in touch with you. So, you know, it does not, uh, we will be in touch with you to close this. But basically, if you want to engage with me on a more uh, intense basis, uh, then I offer a curriculum on Train Your Brain, full curriculum, consists of six modules and uh, full day corporate. Uh, uh, this is the first input full day corporate workshop. This covers three modules, and then there can be a customized intervention. And I also do thinking productivity coaching. So this is the intervention, and I, I will send this to you so that this is there in your slides. Uh, these are the six modules, and they can be customized, etc. The first uh, day, the full day workshop covers these three modules. Right, just for your information, and we can talk more about it on the 9th when we are collecting. Yeah, my contact details are here. Please take down my email ID and please uh, take down my uh, LinkedIn profile, etc. We'll send it to you. You can check that out. Huh? And uh, over to you, Ram. And the only thing is that for 9th, uh, if you have felt interested in this topic and you wish to engage further. I'm going to make my time available to everybody, et cetera, so that we can all sit around the table. You can ask your questions. And if there are any big questions that are there uh, and we have two minutes, I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, many thank you, Mr. Uh, Sethi. Uh, there is one question. In fact, I'll directly go to that. Uh, how do you check the validity of your assumptions? So that was the question from one participant. Uh, Brilliant. I, I think this is further dive. How do you know you're thinking correctly? By checking assumptions. How do you know that your assumptions are valid? Huh? Yes. Now, there are many ways to do it. It depends as to whether that assumption is a fact or whether it is a belief or it's a principle. Okay. If it is in the area of information, data, and fact, huh, then all you have to do is to dig deep into the material to see if it is valid. Okay, like supposing I was to say in Delhi today, oh my God, uh, in, I, I'm in Mumbai right now, it's so hot. Huh? I mean, say it must be very, very hot, etc. Huh? And uh, the temperature must be 38 degrees today. That's an assumption I'm making. And that's why I've got my AC down to working at 20 today. But actually speaking, I can check that out whether the temperature was actually, you know, uh, the assumption I made was it's very hot and therefore I should put maximum cooling on the temperature, but I can check that out. If it is a principle, 
Huh? If it is a belief, huh? then you can check out with some higher authority. So there are multiple ways of doing it. Hmm? And if you think deeply enough, okay, and like I said, ask yourself, hear yourself, hmm? you will get to know if you are on the right track. You will at least get to know that you are on the right track. Hmm? And if you're on the wrong track, you may not know what's wrong with your track, but you will get a sensing key, boss, all is not well. Thank you, Mr. Sethi. I think uh, possibly that's uh, an answer which the participant would have taken. Yeah, and yeah. yeah. And I don't think there are any further questions. So, so, uh, many so what we will do, no, yeah. I'll, I'll just take a minute. Uh, yes, we've yes. got the email IDs of people who are there and we will be in touch with them with further communication. And how do you, how do you want to use the Google link? Because I think we'll use it through mail only. Let people click on the mail for us to know the level yeah. of interest. In fact, that's what I have done. Uh, I have yeah. already put it on the chat uh, for all the participants. So uh, it has both the feedback as well as their interest for the session on November 9. So all participants, please go to that link, which has been put on the chat. Uh, you can uh, uh, click on that. It's a Google form. So fill up that form and express your interest. So if, if you want to be present for the next session, uh, the follow-up session with Mr. Sethi was talking about on 9th of November. So please fill that up and accordingly, you will be contacted for that uh and since there are no more questions and i just have barely a minute left so let me just uh, conclude by thanking mr city for sharing his time uh i'm sure uh, you have got value out of this and in fact uh, i personally have taken quite a few points out of this which i believe would be useful uh and as you rightly mentioned the s1 and s2 so s1 is taking up most of our time and we generally jump to s1 to take some of our quick decisions, but yes, S2 is the one that we need to possibly rely on more and uh, get our uh, sort of life uh, in order. So thank you very much for uh, quite a few things that you have shared, and I believe uh, some people have also asked for the uh, copy of this uh, presentation, which we'll be putting up on our YouTube channel. So those who have missed or want to go or, uh, do a revisit, definitely certain things might uh, take time for them to uh, digest. So for them, for their benefit, it is also there on our, it will be there on our YouTube channel shortly. Uh, so thank you once again, uh, Mr. Sethi. It was a wonderful session and uh, hope to see you again on November 9th, where I believe we'll have possibly a few more people who can take participate in this session and take uh, uh, this concept forward and apply this concept more importantly, rather than just coming and listening to this session. So thank you very much for your time and uh, appreciate your inputs. Thank you, Ram. Thank you, Kaur. And thank you for all the people who have come and attended this and for those who perhaps uh, are not here uh, we will be in touch with them on the next step etc and uh, through emails etc we have your particulars so thank you very much everybody and thanks Ra. thank you thanks bye bye